Can you hear me at the back? No. Yeah. <laughs> There's always one, of course. Right, um, thank you very much for being here. Before I start, um, this is the second time we've done this here, and it's worked really well. And so people in the background organize this, so I think we should really give a warm round of applause to Lauren for really <laughs> making this happen. The three of you and that's it. That was just my icebreaker, really. Uh, so, um, just to introduce myself for those that don't know me. My name is Jonas Kano, and clearly I work for guys. Um, and really, when you look at where we are, it's a fantastic place. And when this building was first built, everyone held it as the future of buildings. And some people might say it's true, some people might say it's not true. But there's some good things about this building. One is that it has 44 lifts, some of them double-decker lifts. And it doesn't matter what floor you need to go to, once you program the lift to go to your floor, it will take, at the most, 30 seconds. Some of you are thinking, 30 seconds, really? Well, actually, time it, and it does take less than 30 seconds. But uh, there's so many sensors in this building, so many different networks, and they look at the cooling and the heating, they make decisions, literally computer decisions, about what needs to be done in terms of the environmentals. If you go to the V gallery, you would see what they call a reality augmented telescope. So you can clearly look at any part of London and point it to a particular location. And it'll give you history of that building. It'll give you all this information about that location <coughs> in 10 languages. This information is updated constantly. That's what the future is about. That's what digital future is about. And that leads me nicely to what I want to talk about today. And that is thinking about tomorrow's data center infrastructure today. So it's about the future, in a sense. Now, predicting the future can be a nightmare. I mean, loads of people have predicted the future and got it very wrong. I mean, Ken Olsen, who was the chairman of DEC, DEC, Digital, Digital um, Electronics Group, he once said in 77, there will not be one house in the world that will ever have a computer. That was wrong. Even Bill Gates is quite wrong. Bill Gates said, we will never develop 32-bit operating system. It's never going to happen, because no one needs it. How wrong was he? So I'm not going to stand here today and tell you this is exactly how the future is going to be, because I do not know. However, we need to look at what's been happening. Look at some of the drivers. And so there are five areas I want to take you through. If you can take away five things, these are what will be. The first is, let's look at the journey in its entirety. So that will be the past, the present, and the things moving towards the future. Let's look at the drivers for the future. What are the things that happen now that will shape the future? The data center, if you bring it down to the data center level, let's look at the paradigm shift. There are new ways of thinking about data centers now, new ways of operating data centers. Let's consider these, but this might be the hallmark of the future. And let's take that and physically look at what the data center will look like in the future. Maybe it won't look like that, maybe it will. But some of the pointers are suggesting that there's certain things that will determine a data center look in a certain way in the future. Let's examine that. And finally, those that are data center managers, CIOs, home load providers, even suppliers in the industry, what are the things that you can do now that will shape the future, that will really mitigate your data center? In fact, let's find out who's involved in data centers. If you're in charge, or you work in, or you're involved in a data center, can you please raise your hand? Just to get a feel. Right, okay, that's good. Some supplies as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's good. So it's a fair few of you. So hopefully, this will resonate with your thinking, resonate with what you're doing operationally in your data center, and probably give you some ideas for the future. Okay, so I started in this industry, IT, in 97, straight after uni. And as a, you know, as a fresh guy coming out of uni, I was thinking, I want to know about this industry. I want to know everything. I bought a few books. I bought this one. And the reason why this book stands out is because the writer talks about four waves of power. <coughs> and what that means is the evolution of the IT industry from 1964 all the way to, I know it says 2010, but it really goes further than that. Now, what was interesting about this book and the writer is but the predictions he made for now, he made them in 96. And they're coming true. They're really spot on. So if you look at the IT industry, it's gone from system-centric 
to PC-centric, network-centric, and now to content-centric. And this is stuff that he wrote back then. So I want to examine just some of these, just to give us a flavor of where we've been, where we're going through, and how that will shape where we're going to. OK, system-centric. Now, it all started in 1964 with the first proper IBM computer. I'm not sure how many of you remember the first proper IBM computer. I say proper because the first IBM computer was the 710, 710. But the first proper one where you have software separate from hardware, we can upgrade systems, all of that stuff was in 1964. And that was the S360, for those of you who remember. Now, the thing about this was that it was a big computer in a big room, or sometimes a whole building. And there's certain key things that I like to go through with you. One is that it was designed for corporations and organizations. This is about number crunching, that's all. So the key technology is a transistor. Sometimes it started off in the 40s with the valves, then it became silicon, but again, that's the, the key technology. Now, has anyone here heard of Herb Grosch? No. Well, he worked for GE and at IBM, and he came up with Grosch's law. <coughs> now, this law states that computer performance increased as the square of the cost. Simply what that means is, if you pay, if you, if you basically double the cost of the computer, the performance is quadruple. It's not the best price performance, but if you want performance, pay more, simple as that. That's IBM's way. And so, essentially, the vendor offerings was IBM. You have IBM and the Seven Dwarfs, Seven Dwarfs being companies like Univac and Burroughs and GE and Honeywell and not the name more. But essentially, it was really IBM. And the scenario there was, the channel was direct. I deal with you, you deal with me, don't ask how much it costs, you're gonna pay for it. All it will be is, it's gonna land, and you're gonna have to think, when do you want it delivered, and what's the support contract, that's it. And that's how IBM dealt with everyone at the time. The network fo focus, there wasn't a network focus, everything was there within the data center. And that was the original term of data center, the big mainframe. <coughs> From the user's perspective, the focus was efficiency. We're number crunching here. So it's timesharing. We've got a big computer, all departments come in and timeshare and then figure out how we can make things more efficient for other human beings. And the supply structure was vertical integration. Now in 1981, IBM again came out with the first PC and everything changed. Yes, we had many computers leading up to that because of different departments, but the PC era became a massive thing. Massive sea change. First of all, the PC was now directed to the professional, not the corporate. You might have professionals within departments you have your PC, it's now for you, it's individualized. The key technology was a microprocessor, and it was Moore's law that governed this whole period. Now Moore's law, which is the number of transistors per square inch doubles every two years, everyone knows that. But the focus was now on price performance. It's an inverse of Bolsch's law. You get more performance, but for cheaper, because it's going down, which is quite a massive sea change. Another sea change was open standards. You now have IBM compatible PCs, everyone can make it doesn't matter where you are. Just as long as you make it to IBM standards and then you put Microsoft on it, done. Yes, Apple was there with the proprietary system, but that's a separate issue. The channel became a channel, a proper channel. There are some people that are channel managers here, or some people that are in the channel. That's when the channel started, indirect. You have distributors, resellers, installers, and the customer. And obviously, these, these PCs had to be networked. So you have the rise of Novell and the rise of 3Com Cisco. The focus was productivity, though. And again, supply stages was a horizontal chain. Everyone knows this guy. If you don't, it's Bob Metcalf. And basically, what happened in 94 is the World Wide Web, Mosaic, or Netscape, those that remember. Now, <coughs> at that time, I was at uni. I went to University of Bradford. But the most exciting places, fair enough. I knew that. I got there, and I thought, I'm not going to have a good time here, but that's what we're here for, right? At uni. <laughs> Fine, so I decided to take it for myself because there was no real any real gigs. He said, oh, it's a big gig I want to get there. There's only two people on the DJ, nothing happening. <laughs> so I'm going to make this happen myself, right? I'm going to promote gigs. Go around and give out leaflets. I should be studying. Go and give out leaflets. And then, again, people come to my gig. Capacity of the place, 300 to 400. Number of people, 100. I make a profit. I'm fine, right? Profit over 10. Quite a drink. We're done. But Suddenly, the university then decided everyone gets an email address for the very first time. I didn't know what email was. This was new. An email address. So I get my email address. I had a brainwave. 
why don't I send an invite to one of my kids through the email? Why don't I email the whole uni? So I started, right, let me see if I can get a couple of my friends. After two hours, I can't do this. There's like thousands of people this uni. So I got a mate of mine, which I call, now thinking about it, another Matic. Matic is one of our technical guys over there. Really good at all these programming. And he decided to say, I said to him, listen, I want you to send an email to everyone in the university, everyone. I said, fine, just did some programming. Then it was easy, everything was just okay. Out went this email. Now the problem is, when he sent an email to everyone, he sent an email to everyone. The chancellor, the vice chancellor, all the deans as well, all the students, everyone. So I got into some serious trouble because he shouldn't have done that. That was the first ever spam of Bradford University. No one knows about it. <laughs> now you do. The thing is though, when I went to the gig now that I promoted, 500 places the capacity, 2,000 people turned up. Queues going down around the street. That's when I realized the power of the network centric era. That's the beginning of that. It's basically about the World Wide Web. The channel becomes online now. It's not about corporate, it's not about direct, it's not about channel, it's about online offering. The, the key audience is the consumer, <coughs> the professional, not corporations, the individual. And it's all about customer service. Now, that's the network area. Now, I'm not saying that any of these areas have gone away. I'm saying, what is the focus that we're in at any particular time? So here we are now in the present. The guy that wrote this book, um, he had to make a prediction, because obviously he wrote it when he was in the network era. And he said, look, there will be a content-centric era. And he was right. Let's analyze this. The key audience is the individual. Right? I don't want to say mean consumer, but an individual. It's is slight different. The key technology is in microprocessors now, or bandwidth. It's software. That's the key issue. And the governing principle is the law of transformation. Now, I've never heard of the law of transformation until I read this book. So I'm going to dub it Moschella's law, because he's the one that came up with it. But let's look at this law. It says, the law of transformation states, the more an industry or business, and he dubs industry I, focuses on information-based, which he calls bits, information-based processes over product-based processes, yeah? The more that happens, the more exponential the transformational potential is. In simple terms, it means if you're a business and you make stuff, but rather than just focusing on what you make, which is good enough in itself, but you focus on information technology to deliver what you make or to really create a new market, your growth will be exponential. Your transformation as a company, as an industry, as a business will be transformation. I can prove this. Bill Gates, not Bill Gates, sorry, uh, Steve Jobs changed five industries. I just mentioned three of them. And everyone thinks he personally changes industries. But it's the law, this law, the law of transformation that really did it. You've got the phone industry, right? It was happily going away, it was fine. Phone manufacturing, no problem. He comes along and he puts it into internet access and phone and smartphone, all in one device. But the focus was the content, the ability to communicate, the cloud. That was the focus, as opposed to the fact that you manufacture a phone. No one thinks about the iPhone and things. You know, Apple's a really good phone manufacturer. They've got a plant in somewhere in China. It's great. I like the way they manufacture. You're just thinking, the iPhone's great for doing what you need to do, right? And connecting with people, connecting with social media, connecting with um, the internet. And obviously making the iPhone go here and there. And he changed that whole industry. He changed the music industry. He changed animation. It wasn't about drawing. I used computers to change anime with Pixar. And all of this was based on focusing on information-based processes rather than product-based manufacturing processes. And so nowadays, if you know what you're doing as a company and you change, the most important person in the organization isn't the CEO, it's actually the CIO, if he has the right vision. So, that leads us on to where we are now. The cloud is a revolution, and I genuinely mean that. We are in the midst of the biggest revolution in the history of IT, bold statement, I know, but let's look at another revolution. There was a time when, in the original industrial revolution, where factories had to be based around power sources. Literally, that to be at a river, that to be near a, a, a power plant, because that's the only way they can make electricity to keep the factories going. As soon as power became a utility, companies then opened themselves up to do whatever they want to really go for being the business they are, rather than focusing on being held by power manufacturing, power um, production. And so it's the same with IT now. 
rather than just being held down by a data center, held down by IT resources, you can just flip on a switch and away you go, you're in the cloud. Hybrid, private, public, even cloud technologies within your data center, you flip the switch and it's done. You want more resources, we take more. We pay for more. You want less, we take less. It's a subscription service. That's the biggest change. Bigger than um, going to PCs, bigger than going to the network bandwidth, this is the biggest change. So let's look at an example in terms of <coughs> cloud computing. Now, everyone knows Salesforce. They've just bought Heron Tower now. It's Salesforce Tower. And Salesforce were the first people to create CRM. I mean, Act created CRM years ago. It's nice to um, Act created CRM years ago. You had um, Siebel Systems CRM. The difference was they actually, it wasn't the focus on the software, it was the focus on the cloud, really accessing that, that information. That turned that company from a $100 million uh, company 10 years ago to a $5.8 billion company now. And it's purely because of the cloud, purely because of big data. And so that leads us on to big data. Now I've spoken many, many times um, about big data, about how the digital universe is going to double every two years, a bit like Moore's law, and that's all great stuff. But what about the real applications of what big data is about? Because all of these things I'm saying are things that your businesses, wherever you are, are getting involved in. And it's things, therefore, that you as a data center manager or cold provider are supporting or actually creating. So let's look at a couple of applications. Now, in agriculture, in the field, no pun, no pun intended, of agriculture, you have um, a very simple scenario where you have your plot of land, you have your single um, um, grain of corn and what have your crop, just a single variety, and then you, you plant your, your seeds. After the time you take your yield, your yield typically is about between 40 and 60%. Why? Because it's not all the same in terms of that plot of land. What happens now in agriculture? That guys that get involved in big data? Well, it's simple. They have sensors on every square foot of that piece of land. Sensors. Why? Because those sensors would check the salinity, the soil um, chemistry, the moisture content, the temperature, which is different for every single foot on that piece of land. And so therefore, they can match that information that's unique to that square foot with the right variety of corn or the right variety of wheat. And then they can then distribute the right variety. And what does that do? The yield becomes between 95 and 99%. That's just a simple thing. But so much data involved in that that you need big data analytics to make the right decisions. Another part is finance, world of finance. Now, we all know about finance, buying and selling, but high frequency trading is now a big buzzword. That is trading by the split second. So you're changing, you're buying and selling literally as the day goes on, and at the end of the day, you can decide what losses or what gains you made. Now, where big data comes into this, and we're just looking at the company information you're about to buy, or people are saying, you actually use big data to get information from all the social media networks across the world, all the news sites across the world. You find out where the trends are moving in the slightest form. That's big data that can do that. Get that information and then make the decisions on an ongoing basis per split millisecond throughout the day. That's high frequency trading. So these are just two examples and there's lots of areas where big data is applied in our society. So that brings us on to the Internet of Things. You've got all these networks out there. And I don't like to use the word Internet of Things anymore because it's moved on from that now. You have Hardware, software, VMware, you have everywhere, where everything is connected now. People, things, sensors, networks, <coughs> from home automation to cities, everything is connected to the internet. That's a lot of data that's been passed around. What happens with that data? What do you do with it? All right, simple example. Everyone knows the iWatch. By the way, if you fill out all your forms, Literally fill it out to the end. I'm not saying just fill three quarters, but not again all of that. If you fill out the form, you have a chance of winning an iWatch, apparently, according to marketing. I'm not saying you don't believe marketing. I'm just saying that you might win an iWatch. Um, so that's by and by. And I've just been told that I have to say that now the iWatch is on. So I've said it, though. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, but the point is that wearable technology is a big area now. Um, I'm speaking to the VP of International Operations. Um, Gordon. 
Um, and he was telling me about it. he just bought one. So I think that bike one is about three years, I think bought it. But he's just bought one and he loves it. It's very intuitive. One of the things that when he drives, he has a sat nav that's connected synced into his phone. And it gives you a little tap, two taps to go left and three taps maybe to go right. Just very subtle. You still see things, but that's the, the thing you can do. It's also involved in health applications as well. Now, we all had a meeting, had this big, serious, you know, half year sales management meeting. Everyone was there talking about serious stuff. You know, I was trying to impress people by trying to be serious about my sales. Um, and then suddenly, Gordon just stood up, just like that, just for no reason, just stood up. Why are you standing up? Oh, the, the, the iWatch is talking to you. It's tapping, you need to stand up. So it's analyzing your body and making decisions for you to say, stand up. I wanted to say, well, there might be certain situations where you might not want to stand up, but really, yeah, I'm talking about driving, by the way, nothing. So, um, but that's that's the thing about wearable technology. Now you can get thousands of points that's on you that can go into the web, help application, um, help insurance companies, life insurance, could help you know hospitals. That information is all there. Again, all through Internet of Things or everywhere. Another area is this guy. This this. Let me introduce you to Jack. Now Jack is a driverless car, um, an, a, an Audi A7. What's special about it is, in January this year, it, wouldn't be a he, even though they gave it the name Jack, let's say it drove from San Francisco to Las Vegas, right, 550 miles. Now, there are numerous amounts of networks and sensors on this car. You have so many um, multi-core processors on the car and it actually does 8 billion calculations a second. 70 miles an hour, indicating what have you, is perfect. And this is the future, but you can imagine when everyone has a driverless car, legislation and attitudes permitting, you can imagine the amount of data that will go to insurance companies, <coughs> those that will go to um, the manufacturing to check for defects and make sure everything's fine, those that will go to you, you know, it's about in terms of how you're driving. So, um, you know, that's another area. What does this mean all mean? Well, it means that there'll be a massive demand for power. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but clearly power is going up exponentially in many cases. Now, there might be a whole thing about how much of that is utility power and how much of that will be how much of that in the future will be renewable energy that you create yourselves. That's a different debate, and I'll come on to that uh, in a bit. But clearly there's a demand for more power. So when you bring it down to the data center level now, which is where you guys are involved. There is a paradigm shift out there. Whether you like it or not, things are starting to happen. If you go to cloud scale data centers, they will be implemented stuff, this stuff. And it's gonna come down to colos, the hosting companies, and enterprise data at some point, if you wanna stay competitive. So let's look at this. Everyone knows that the operational focus is mean time between failure or mean time to failure. You wanna buy a piece of kit, piece of hardware, how long is it gonna last me? My life cycle of my data center is 10 years. If this can last for 12 years, I'm a happy man, as long as I can afford it. That's the focus. That's the traditional way of looking at hardware. From servers to UPSs to whatever it is, how long will it last me? I'm gonna get the most reliable one. In the new paradigm, the three laws of operations are very simple. Hardware is gonna fail, period. Software is gonna have bugs in it. It is. And human beings will make mistakes. That's a given. So therefore the focus shouldn't be on whether this is gonna fail, because it's gonna fail. The focus is how quickly can we recover when the failure does happen? So it becomes mean time to recovery. That's the focus. We affect the whole system, the holistic system, if this part fails, because I don't want it to, but it's gonna fail. That's the focus. So resiliency, we are normally used to M plus one, or even two N, but it's really just backup. You have an active and you have a backup. Whether you want it, let's say with the UPS, you might have M plus one, but they're both running, both are 50% maximum, and then one fails over to the other, fine. But it's still an active and a backup. But in the new paradigm, there is no value in dormant resources. Why? It's an accountant's nightmare. You just bought a piece of kit you're never really gonna use. You have five cracks, and only four of them you need. The one's dormant. You might cascade between cracks, but you know, technically there's only one crack that's not gonna be used. Why? No, everything's active, everything's there. You just put it on and it works. If it fails, you're gonna deal with it. That's the new paradigm. 
So you have your infrastructure that's in silos. Everything's in silos. I was at a data center um, in Canary Wharf yesterday with, with Tio. And the data center manager was so enthusiastic. He said, thanks for coming to data center. I want to show you all these wonderful things. I was thinking, hang on, I'm a supplier trying to sell to you, but you're selling me your data. That's great. All right? So we went around and said, look, come, come let me show you. This is where the storage is. And he took me over to the storage section. and see all these nice green EMCs, all there, all the rack stacks. So this is the storage bit. It deals with storage applications all the way to the storage services. Great. And then let me show you the, the, the section to do with our marketing experts. All their servers and they deal with the marketing, voice recording, for example. This is a bank, by the way. This is the bit here. And it took us to the different section of the data center. And it, it occurred to me that this data center is designed in silos. They don't even talk to each other. It's just there from the hardware all the way up. Well, in the new paradigm, everything is converged. Everything's the same. It's a homogeneous environment. This is in silos. The hardware is customized. How many times have you said, right, I need to buy, um, and we've got a new ERP system, SAP. Now we need to start buying hardware and stuff. Right, okay, what hardware do we need? We need to get the right hardware that fits this application in terms of the speed and all the wonderful stuff. And you have a vendor that will sell you what you need and uh, what you think you need. That's highly customized. That's just for the application. But in the new environment, everything's the same. All the hardware is the same. Low grade, silicon, you know, it's stuff that is easy to get. You only deal with the components that you need. Everything else comes out. So it's at the component level. And you just roll that out. Everything's homogeneous. It's commoditized. The deployments that we have now, the same example with the SAP uh, ERP that came in the system, how long is it going to take for you to deploy that, to plan that, to really order that, to get it all set up? Maybe potential downtime at the big break of PDU level just to get all the hardware in. In a new paradigm, you know, that's going to take minutes. It's automated and it's software level, it's not hardware. Reliability in, in today is in the hardware. Reliability today will be in the software. What does that mean? It means that the hardware is just an engine. You just have black boxes in and out, no problem, it's all converged. The real power is in the software. You probably know where I'm going with this in terms of software defined data centers. But that's where data centers are moving now. Already that's been happening in the cloud. Big cloud companies, you know, the, the, the normal guys, the, the Googles and the Ebays and the, the Amazons and the Microsoft as well. They're already doing this. And this will start to cascade down. The final bit is the whole point of data centers. No point of the IT space, the infrastructure space. Normally, it's to support the business. That's what you do. You're a support company or a support organization. Business is trying to come away and you're there to make sure that the critical systems are up and anything they need is going to happen. But tomorrow, in the future, you are the service. You're creating new services. You're creating new ideas, new cloud, but new opportunities to make sure that the company you work for or you're dealing with is actually creating new opportunities in their market space. Because IT, going back to the law of transformation, is what transforms companies, whatever business you're in. That's where the CIO comes into it. So this is where the data center is changing in terms of the paradigm shift. Let's have an idea, let's have a look at what an infrastructure will look like in by 2025, let's say, 10 years time. Now, this is just an idea. Who knows what it will look like? It might be that it looks exactly the same as today. But here are some thoughts I want to share with you. So I want to run through them. Support new technologies, flexibility and scaling, infrastructure convergence, which you just mentioned about, self-healing or self-management, automation and control. Is it software defined? What does that really mean? Sustainable energy source and thinking about legislation. Let me go through them one very briefly, go through them one by one. So this is Hadoop. Um, guy uh, gets involved in uh, creating this open Java, open source uh, platform, gets home, thinks of a name, and then sees this, this, his kid's yellow elephant toy. Kid, what do you call this toy, child? Hadoop, <coughs> like a great name. And so therefore, starts. those that don't know what Hadoop means, it's essentially a big data analytical tool that's changing the face of how big data is analyzed. A, a, data, a database doesn't cut it anymore, it doesn't. You need to have parallel systems, you um, need to have different data sets that can deal with the huge amount of data that comes through. And so this is a new technology which data centers have to deal with. What about the stuff with the pie in the sky? We never know where it goes. Sanford University, um, they came up with 
they found a way of um, inventing an aluminium battery. Now, no big deal. The problem is, the good thing about this battery is it can charge your mobile phone in 60 seconds. Now, what can that do for the data center in the future? Maybe? Or even now with lithium ion batteries, Tesla's come out with a power pack for data centers, lithium <coughs> ion, particularly around renewable energy. So maybe you don't need to use a utility anymore. Maybe you can use solar, and this works very well with um, solar or even wind uh, energy levels, and then just stores it in the battery. Um, so the discharge time is so much better than the batteries that we're used to today that go with EPSs. Just some examples um, of new technology which data center managers, codos, cloud providers are thinking about now, should be thinking about. What about flexibility and scale? We have a client, one tell you who, a cloud provider. And currently they have 15 football pitches of data center space, 15, no big deal. But in five years time, they only go to 50 football pitches of data center space, five zero. Now, when I ask them, how are you gonna do that? They say, we don't know. As in, they want to scale, but they will need to be flexible enough to decide how they're gonna go as time goes up. They might have, um, they might have, you know, I don't know, another 30 in a year. It might be just half of it a year, and then the next year, 15. No one really knows. It all depends on the industry, depends on um, their clients, depends on the environment. But the point is, they want flexibility and scale at the same time. So if you use the old paradigm, where you have customized solutions around hardware, where you have M plus one, it's going to be a nightmare to try and scale up and be flexible at the same time. But with a new converged paradigm, all you have is just a black box. That's it, Converge, just hardware. Just put it in, take it out, has no effect. You scale up really quickly, you scale down really quickly. You're flexible. So these two concepts, flexibility and scale, are not diametrically opposing. They actually work hand in hand. So this is something that you guys will be thinking about in the next five to 10 years. Infrastructure convergence. It's not about IT now as um, different parts of a stack, but more just a service. That's it. How can facilities and IT come together? Because facilities and IT have to. IT can't for <coughs> forge ahead without facilities coming behind it or being with it. They have to forge ahead together. How can this be packaged into a proper convergence? And this whole thing about self-healing, um, and it's not just self-healing, there's self-configuration, self-optimization, self-protection, and that was the self-healing. And IBM does all of this you know, self-management. But that's a real potential now, where you put the software in and it just runs itself. Any issues, it just deals with it as, it as it happens. Now, the interesting thing about that is that leads on to automation and control. So machines, you'll be running machines. They'll be running each other. And it's not that there won't be a data center manager or an IT manager, but the role of these individuals will change. They have more of a strategic role because the business needs IT to stay in their marketplace for whatever you do. So many examples where businesses do simple things. I mean, the classic example is Domino's Pizza. What does Domino's Pizza do? They put toppings on a piece of dough, put it in the oven, and then there's a pizza. Right, it's straightforward. Not the best tasting pizza of all the pizza companies out there. But they're the biggest pizza company in the world. I mean, they're like, I think they're, they're worth now 1.83 billion in the last three years as a company. And the reason why they're that is because most guys, I mean, at home, you know, with my kids, we have got pizza nights. Lovely, you know, every Tuesday or Wednesday, depends on when I'm at home. Pizza night, okay. So we're watching TV and say, well, okay, pizza night, uh, you know, this time around, what we're going to do? We'll have a meat freeze, great. Um, can you sort it out, please? Say to Jonathan, for example. Uh, no one can find the phone. No one cares about the phone. Jonathan just gets the iPad and just goes, credit card. <laughs> That's it. And then half an hour later, your pizza arrives. It's the mode of delivery that made Domino's as powerful as they are because they thought about how they can use IT and content and cloud to actually transform their business rather than just, let's make better pizzas. And that paradigm is now, should be across all industries. So coming back to this, it's a case of really thinking how can you fully automate your data center? What, are the, what is the software, the, 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 the thinking, the hardware that can help you do this? Now, I've talked earlier about software-defined data center, and we know about virtualization. Everyone knows about that in the computation, in the, in the computing field. 
And that extended to networks with software defined networks and it extended to storage, software defined storage. That's great. So now we have the concept of software managing all of these areas. But the scary thing, the scary but the interesting thing about this is that it's only part of the stack, this section. It is. What about the physical infrastructure? How does that get involved in software defined data? It just seems that it's just about storage, networks, and virtualization. How can, like I said, you can't leave facilities behind or you'd be limited. So how does facilities fit into this space? Well, here's another stack. Those that are, are familiar with Unix, I don't know how many of you are, um, but here's a typical Unix stack. So at the top you have your applications and you have a kernel. And at the bottom you have positive the physical devices of the Unix. And in between, you have the hardware abstraction layer, the how. And this how basically communicates between the software and the kernel and the hardware bit. Now, do we have a how when it comes to software defined data centers? How can something connect with all the physical infrastructure, the chillers and the pumps and the UPSs, PDUs, electrical infrastructure, and really communicate with the software defined data center to have a full holistic software defined data center across the whole stack. That is where automation starts to come in. It's my view. It's <coughs> difficult. It's decent. You get the right decent product, decent forms the how. The equivalence. Let's call it PAL, physical <laughs> abstraction layer. You know, but it's the goal between. And this is not happening today. Everyone takes DCIM as a separate silo. DCIM is dealing with the physical infrastructure or dealing with asset management within the, the racks. That's fine. But tomorrow, everything has to be holistic. And if we don't leave, if we if we don't focus on how DCIM can connect with the physical uh, layer, then the facilities are going to be left behind, which hampers everyone else. But it's about power. It's about cooling. So DCIM is the the key between the two. It's the how, the power, should I say? In my opinion. Does this go? And then you have sustainable energy. Um, now, it could be <coughs> anything, but the interesting thing about this whole issue is big companies, because it's going to be more dense, and you're going to have to start thinking about energy as a utility or on site energy. But the issue is, it's quite funny because I've just said to you that manufacturing companies. In the, in the older days need to be near an energy source because they have to have the on-site energy. And then they started dealing with utilities. Now we have um, companies that provide IT utilities that need another energy source at the same, back to the same problem. But that's the reality. How can we create renewable energy sources? You have solar, you have wind, you have natural gas, you have nuclear that can come on stream. Yes, you have a data center that needs nuclear energy. Speaking of wind, just literally uh, a week ago, Facebook has been granted planning permission for saying this for a need for anyone out there. They've been granted planning permission in, our, in Dublin for massive data center. Right? It's one of these big data centers, but it has to be fully operated on wind. No utility, no backup power, wind. That's it. That's the plan for that particular data center. <coughs> that should come on stream in a couple of years. But it's about renewable energy. That's the key thing here. The funny thing about renewable energy and data centers is, and this is a bit controversial, but it's been talked about, so I'll say it. A lot of this now means that there may not be a need for generators on site. And there may not be a need for UPSs. You use renewable, you control the energy source. So therefore you control how clean it is. Therefore, do you need a UPS? Oh. It's gonna be there, you control its availability. Do you need a generator to back up? Again, this is back to the new paradigm. Do we need backup when everything's active and you're focusing on how you can keep things running? without actually having redundant resources, as it were. So this is a consideration. The last bit is legislation. <coughs> this is not a physical thing, but it's very important. What is legislation, legislation around the movement of data? Your data center managers, but you're managing data. And data is key, because that's a compliance issue. So how do, you, how do you manage that whole paradigm? I'm not saying you're going to end up all being lawyers, but it's an important consideration. Renewable energy, power source, um, carbon trading. These are all things that will become more and more prevalent on a data center manager's time in the future. So really those are the 
the the um, the areas that if you look at data set in the future, that's what it may look like. So what can you do now as a data center manager, data center director, CIO, IT manager, code provider, any names? But what can any of you do now that can actually help you move into this brave new world as it were? Well, I put up a Venn diagram here, and this Venn diagram has only got three circles. Now, there could be many more, but these three circles represent how you view, or how you could view, your data center. Uh, so just a lens, just three lenses. Now, there could be many more, as I said, but I want to just focus on these three for now. So one is, you can view your data center as a smart entity. How do you make it smarter? You know, how do you move into things like automation and control, possibly even AI in the future? when it comes to the data center itself. How do you future-proof the physical infrastructure? I don't like the word future-proof, right? Because it's almost like you're proofing your way from the future. But more like, what are the things you can do so that that future is not too um, daunting? And efficiency is always the key, because whichever way you look at it, we've talked about um, big data, we've talked about cloud computing, we've talked about power increase. You want to have high density. High density is the name of the game. You try to avoid it for so long. Try to stick to the 32 amp, the 7.3 K KVA. Don't go above it. Get another rack. You know, at some point, it's going to be the name of the game. You know, I mean, we're not like the states where our, our voltage and amps are pretty. You know, so they can't. We can't ramp up as they can. But it's going to get to a point where 63 amp, three phase, whatever. We're going to start thinking about it. How do you get it to be efficient? Because it's still a cost. So these are the three areas, and I want to share some some ideas with you. These are just ideas. Yeah. So let's look at the smart data center. So how do you make your data center smart, or at least start to make it smart at the ground level? Up. You can worry about the higher things later. You've got to start somewhere at the beginning. You've got to monitor performance. That, that monitoring will then detect inefficiencies. This is something that you can do. Give you alerts. We're talking alerts in real time. It doesn't necessarily have to be. If you're polling every second, you can clog up your network traffic, fair enough. But if you do things like you pause every 15 minutes and as soon as there's a particular value it gets to, then you pause every second because it's an issue. However, but it's got to have alerts, real time or not real time. Got to diagnose the problem. You've got to get long-term information, right? Data. You've got to capture it and you've got to trend it so you can make proper strategic decisions. <laughs> Just want to sort of touch on something here. The reason, why, the reason why trending is so important is because we all talk about these things all the time. It's been a buzzword word for since I was a baby. I mean, five, ten years ago, we talk about decent. I see that still people don't understand what these or want to understand, what these, or even if there is a meaning of decent. It's a multifaceted meaning, depends on which angle you're coming from. But a lot of guys are still going out to, to buy decent, like really proper, you know, decent across the whole stack. You've got to measure everything, you've got to monitor everything. You know, it's, it's going to be fine. And they buy all this decent, and, and it becomes shelfware after six months. <laughs> Why? Because they don't know what to do with it. Well, I always say, well, it's all very well saying you want decent, but you have no idea, a lot of time, what processes you're trying to create that the decent will be effective. What about a simple thing as monitoring? Just monitoring your data center. And the reason why I say monitoring for trending over a long period is all businesses work in cycles. Even the data center itself has a pulse in terms of the cycle. How are you going to know your cycles if you don't just monitor? Don't worry about what you're doing with it, because that's the whole point of the results from your trend, is to decide what to do with this information to make tactical strategic decisions. But just monitor. Find out what your cycles are. Is it six months? Is it three years? Is it 10 years even? I don't know. But the point is that in getting the information, over time you'll be able to now determine the nature, the DNA of your business from, a, uh, from this level. Then you can start thinking about, what can I use this in for now that I understand a bit more about my business or my data center? And that's really where monitoring comes into its own. A lot of people just think monitoring is just there to aid a decent. Maybe monitoring is there to make you make decent better work for you. So again, it's just a side thing for you guys to consider. So this is where I'm a salesman and I'll be a salesman. If you want to monitor stuff, you have to buy some monitoring kit from us, right? But You've got to think about, obviously, what to monitor. What do you monitor? Anything that has a value that changes, anything. It's not just the obvious stuff like temperature and humidity. How do you know the general state of your data center? Because you don't try and monitor everything. 
from the physical infrastructure all the way up. We get our PDUs. Um, PDUs can be just power distribution, great. You know, it distributes the power, 32 amp command socket on one side, and then obviously your servers and the other, or your blades. That's fine. But yeah, you've got a space in there, that rack space. That's so important. Remember what happens in that space that you need to know to make decisions on. Particularly if you go into the new paradigm, where you really don't want to touch that space because it's just a black box. So there you go. And then you've got the brain. When I say the brain, I mean the brain of the physical infrastructure which will, through my idea, connect with the brain as the PAL, as I said, to the software defined data center in the future once you've got a, a, a holistic environment. But yeah, the brain of data center. I could do all what really wonderful stuff. And what about future proofing the data center itself? Here's another example. Yeah, so what do we have here? <coughs> this is it, really, similar, apart from the bit that comes like that, right? Um, basically, simple PDU, no problem. Now, if you're worth your weight in gold as a PDU manufacturer, this PDU, on its own, no controls, no networks, will last forever. It's, it's just connections, really. It's just IEC sockets, C19, C13s, connected to a buzz bar, a buzz way. Got your breakers, maybe, if it's over 60 now, where we go, all right? And by itself, it will last forever if you're good at making PDUs. Um, if you don't use displacement to connect it all, or you use fast bonds, or you solder it across the board, which is what we do, it's going to be good. But the only problem is this bit. This may not last. Now, the issue with these PDUs is one of the biggest reasons to actually bring down a whole rack is this <coughs> bad boy here. It's a nightmare. You're bringing down this thing, and normally you bring it down for reasons other than, unless of course you made a mistake of the, the on stream and you you blew it and that wasn't the PDU's fault, that's something to do further upstream. But outside of that, um, it's normally because of these bad boys. So, what if you just did this? So you put this on and it stays forever, you're future proofing. Now, the thing about things like this, like the wheels of a car, is in a thousand years' time, it's still going to be around the wheels of a car. So this can stay for as long as it wants to. So in the end, the future becomes like a time machine, wonderful stuff, and this is still humming in the, in the rack itself. This though, this is the sexy stuff. This is the exciting stuff. Because in the future, this would not be the same. That would be the same. This would be very, very different. Right? So now, yeah, we have environmentals, normal stuff. You know, we have RJ45 through the network here, and you have resilience um, um, in terms of the, um, the data chain scenario. But we're doing wireless. So we're thinking about wireless stuff. I don't know. Um, Maybe APIs in the future where you can write your own software that's directly to the PDU. Or well, it could be location services. But now you can use this for asset management. You can now, um, it will tell you that we're located here and this is what's in the rack. Who knows where we can go with this? And all you do in the future, you can even bring AI to this. You have a massive processor that really runs this. And then you get this to start to organize stuff within the, who knows? No one knows. But the point is that when it does happen, when the future does arrive, it's future-proof, literally, you just change it, that's it. But this is an example you know, of the things that, that we can do. But then, I've already talked about the black box scenario, where you have a rack, and the rack is exactly the same, it's homogeneous across the board. So, if you wanted to monitor stuff, maybe you don't want to actually even open the rack. Maybe it's just there, and if it breaks down, fine, just take it away, put another one in, because that's the new paradigm, right? And I've talked all about that, our software, blah, blah, great stuff. What if you put it in the tap off instead? What if this bad boy went into the tap off? So you still got your rack, but the breakers and the monitoring are outside the rack. No reason to go on your rack. It's just a converged rack, black box. Take it, take it away, what have you. But you still want to monitor stuff. You still want to see how things are so you know the decisions you want to make. Just put this in the, in the uh, tap off. We work with Siemens, a number of tap off companies. Um, that makes sense to do that. Now efficiency. Now yes, we know about hot hour and cold hour. And we're not saying that we are a cooling company. We don't provide you know, DX or chilled water systems. But hot airflow is a key thing. And so there's some of the things, some of the solutions we have around switch air, where we take cold air to the switch, which is the biggest cause of packet loss in data centers, is a hot switch. It's not going to turn over. 
mean, it's not going to fade over, but it will start giving you packet loss. But also, um, other ideas around you know, chimney systems where you take hot air and um, you work it that way. I'm not going to go really into that, but it's just some of the solutions that we do as a company. Now, I talked earlier about automation, which I think is the next step of really getting involved in um, data center management across the stack. But automation within the physical infrastructure is now possible right, with variable frequency devices um, from pumps, chillers, what have you. Now, just imagine that the DSIM took control, I mean real control, of your physical devices. So it's not just DSIM for asset management or monitoring stuff and telling you this is what's going on. But really use the right platform to take control and make decisions for you in real time. So this is a classic example, right? Here's our DSIM, no problem. We've got five cracks. Now really, it's an M plus, it's not even an M plus one, they're all active, really. But normally, they would have a sensor to tell the crack, you can turn off now, because we don't really need you. And then the sensor can say, you can come back on, and you can go at a certain fan speed. The problem with that, though, is that it creates a lag and still have your, your hotspots. Because the sensor is at the top of the crack, and you wait for the hot air to come back, hit the top of the crack, and then the decision will be made. What if you had sensors in the rack, around the rack, behind the rack, everywhere, just as many sensors as you want as part of your monitoring strategy. But that information, which is real-time information, goes to the DSIM, and the DSIM starts talking to the cracks. I say, okay, crack, turn it off now. Okay, ramp up, ramp down, really quickly, all this in real time, fully automated. Um, that's what DSIM does. Not all DSIMs do that. Not all DSIMs are equal. This is because we have a, a platform that really gets involved in automation and control. The platform is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Niagara. Sounds like something, but I'm saying Niagara like the falls, right? And, um, and that's, a honey, that's, that's by Trillium, which is a trend, uh, sorry, a honey rock. And so they get involved in building management systems. We're talking about cities um, or manufacturing processes. And that's the platform that we work on. So it's about control and it's about automation. So what I want to do is just really just show you a little video about the software division and the kind of things that they're doing. Geist has been in business since 1948. We are a provider of data center solutions. I work as the president of the DCIM division for Geist. Data centers are a very critical environment. If a data center goes down, it's literally millions of dollars that it costs these companies when they have a data center outage. The Niagara framework that we then build on and present as a Geist product helps them in real-time monitoring and alerting, so we call it operational awareness. What we mean by operational awareness is to get beyond just listening for alarms or seeing alarms and going and trying to react to those things, but also then move out to a predictive state. That's what our products do, is take uh, that operational awareness and move it to a predictive state so that you can maybe be ahead of any catastrophe that would come. You would foresee it and be able to do some things that would uh, mitigate against that before it becomes a problem. An open framework is very important, not only for Geist, but for a data center manager in general. And Niagara obviously provides this openness and this ability to just have a framework that you know you can uh, support through multiple channels. Speed to market is really important to us and so having this openness and being able to modify the Niagara framework, bring that all together and get to market quickly is very important. In our one instance with RackNet, the time to market was reduced by what our competitors put out. They took about 16 man years to develop their software offering. We exceeded their software offering and built it in six man months. There's just a competitive advantage there that is unmatched. We're up against multi-billion dollar corporations that are our competitors. But for the future, we believe that that Niagara platform gives us the foundational elements that we need. And we can take our small team of engineers and compete with these large conglomerates. The Niagara framework is Geist's business. Foundationally, it is a core element of what we do. That you know ability to integrate with any device in the data center, that ability to be very nimble and, and take our engineering staff and add to the product so that we can create a unique product offering in the marketplace is very important to us. You see, that's, that's, a, that's Matt Lane, he's the president of the, he's based in Colorado, um, Fort Collins, and he's the, he deals, he's head of the decent division. So that's, just, that's uh, a business within the business, because we're all proven, I'll tell you a little bit about guys you know, after this. Um, but, you know, his, his focus is 
obviously Niagara, because I think this was for a Niagara summit. But it's important to, to note a number of points he made. Operational awareness, you know, being able to predict rather than just react. So that seems to be um, a trend there. You've got reaction, and then you have prediction. What if you go AI in the future? What does that, how does that work? That could be a possibility within decent that really hits with the, uh, the data center, um, software by data center. So these are really just thoughts that we're in labs, really considering, really bringing out new products, trying to really forge ahead with the industry into the future. So that really leads me neatly to my penultimate slide. Just have a last slide for this, but I still going to talk to you about guys. But these are neatly to this slide, which is your eye on the future. So we talked about products, we talked about technologies, we talked about paradigm shifts and thought processes. But really, if you are going into the future as data center managers, people that run data centers, you're, you're responsible for that, that space on behalf of your company. So the company expects you to forge into the future. What are the things that are most important to you? Well, one of the things that I think is really important is relationships. It comes down to it at the end of the day. All I mean by that is, all the stuff that's been happening in the industry, all this time we've gone through the, the, the systems era all the way to the content-centric era. It's been about people. People inventing things, people striking relationships, forging deals, working together. And that's what the future is about. It's about people. Now, what in this case, what I mean by that is suppliers. Who are your suppliers? Who are you working with? Are they suppliers? Where well, it's just a case of, hey, I need a particular widget. Who can give me the cheapest widget? I can give you the cheapest widget. I'll have it. Fine. You put it in, everything's fine. But actually, that widget didn't really help you get to where you needed to go. But it was the cheapest, so that's fine. I'm not saying that we're the most expensive, but is that your only paradigm in terms of working with a partner? Well, we consider things differently. You need to work with a partner that has a vision for the future, just like you do. You have a vision for the future. Those that work with a partner that has a similar vision, a shared vision, works right. It works correct. It works great. So when you're considering your partners, do they have a vision like you do? Do they have a strong R&D program that fits into that vision? Because IT is not going to stand still. Data centers are not going to stand still. So why should products stand still? Why should companies that develop those? You need a strong program. So these are the things you've got to consider. Do they understand DC trends? Everybody wants to jump on the cloud. Everyone wants to jump on the infrastructure. Bandwagon. They come from various industries to say, we've got something for you in data centers. I'm not a company that are based in the, the to do with the automotive industry. That's it. All of a sudden, we provide data center products. I have no idea of what, the, of what the data center industry is about. Yeah, you need companies that can understand data center trends. Not just understand these trends, but actually actively create these trends so that you can forge your head together in the right place. I mentioned about, well, you want the cheapest. And no one's saying that have to be more expensive. We have to have a fundamental understanding of cost in real terms, whether it's operational expenditure or capital expenditure, the element of cost. Cost related to time as well, as opposed to how much does it cost right now, done deal. And of course, you know, as goes as given, you know, we have to be financially stable as a company. But I said, I talked earlier about relationships and people, but it is really about people. Some of the biggest alliances, the biggest deals, the biggest new inventions and things and innovation has happened because people agree with one another, understand each other, and simply work together. It's actually on that basic level. And that's it. It's, it's going to be a company that's easy to work with. So as an industry, rather than thinking as a data center manager, but as an industry, consultants, suppliers, managers, um, speculators, <coughs> even, they all come together, and end users, they all come together and form an industry and forge your head into the future. And we hope that Geist can be part of that future if you're already not with every single one of you. So for that, I want to thank you for your time and I want to tell you a little bit about Geist before we start that. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me just say about Geist very, very quickly. Some of you have worked with us for many years. Some <coughs> of you have just thought, I'm told to come to the show, I'm not sure what this Geist business is, I just want to drink. But you're here now, so I'm going to tell you about Geist. Um, Geist has been around since 1948. Um, and it started off with two telecoms engineers who, who um, were in war and they invented um, a device which is an anti-trip device within computer rooms. 
or would it teleconsult? But from there, their clients started asking them about power devices, and that's how we got involved uh, in power distribution, PDUs, particularly around data processing rooms, and then it moved on to the rack itself. But we're now four companies in one, or four areas. We're calling four cor cornerstones. <coughs> Literally, the four cornerstones. You can see every cornerstone has got something, right? So if you start with power, it's our stable of our business. So it's power distribution, rack power distribution, and everything involved in that. What's unique about the rack power di distribution is it got to a point where um, you typically deal with a standard, com a standard power distribution um, company. So you say, right, I have 10 racks, and they're all different, customized in different ways and what have you, but I just need uh, a standard PDU. OK, fine, I'll have one with so many um, sockets and try my best to just fit it in. <coughs> what we do is that we, we manufacture to order, We're like Dell in that respect. You just tell us exactly what type of PDU you want, what's your cost. It's the cost of a normal standard for a competitor. And we manufacture that PDU for, for you. So our manufacturers in the UK, we have manufacturing facilities in, in the States as well, and also in the APAC region. But that's us in that, in that perspective. Um, we deal with cooling, not really cooling, I would say airflow management. Um, so you know, our focus is, what do you do with the air? The more you focus on hot air management or cold air management with your data center, the more you cool that data center. Or at least get it to the temperature that it's designed to be. It doesn't have to be freezing. That doesn't work. It's just throwing money away. I'm talking about the optimum temperature. Maybe according to Green Grid, you know, 27 degrees outlet temperature. Who knows? But these are <coughs> these are things that we control. That we don't just use um, just simple cooling at the, in terms of the airflow going around. But we look, we use monitoring systems to actually get the optimum airflow and the optimum temperature that's required. Um, we also deal with monitoring. We have to monitor stuff. So um, what is monitoring connected to the PDUs or monitoring as separate consoles? Um, we get involved in monitoring because that is the stable mate of any data center management system. So you've got to monitor something and then make decisions accordingly. And then we have the brain of data center, the decent. So um, we have a, a, we're based in that part of the company, as I said, it's based in Fort Collins. I have a team of, um, of software programmers and we're always constantly looking at new ways to have data center managers like you guys run your data center. So that's us as a company. We see ourselves as a global company. We're based in, in, in the Americas, based in APAC, and we're based here, that deals with EMEA. Uh, 285 employees. Um, we're building a new factory in America, which I think is 87, 500 square foot, which will be open next year. We're really going places as a global company. So again, thank you very much for your time. I hope it's been insightful for you guys, and if you have any questions, hey, I'm here. Thank you. Any questions? You shout out, and someone's going to bring up the mic around. He was going to be that big mic. But um, so I've said a lot. I'm tired of talking. Someone else be talking. Any questions? Right, DC. So right, DC power. Aha, uh, current power. Did everybody hear that? Okay. What about direct current power? Yes. What's your thoughts on whether DC power will come in in Europe? America's pushing it, but yeah. I don't think the same things count over here. No, it's, it's, hey, it's a good question. Um, maybe I'm not technical enough to answer that, to be fair. But um, in, in terms of opinions, a lot of it is not just about technology. A lot of it is about attitudes. Um, it's almost like, I'm not kind of like moving away from the point, but it's almost like fast pressure and, um, and water, water sprinkling systems in the States actually doesn't change there, so it's still sprinkler systems in data centers. Why have water in your data centers? Um, but here, it's fire suppression systems, gas systems. Now, um, in terms of DC, there isn't, it doesn't seem to be a take up, so therefore the industry is not pushing that. But America always leads the way, and if that comes through in the States, I can't see why it won't be an issue, it won't be something here. I know when it comes to battery technology, like Tesla's power pack and what have you, that's already in place, at least from a larger scale. So DC comes down to the rack scale in some form, then, of course, there's, there'll be a powerful place for these new battery technologies. But that's a long way off, if that ever happens, to answer the question. And that's not technical, I know. I'm the sales guy. I'm sorry. But if anyone else, of one of my guys, whether it's Marik or T.O.'s got opinions, they can shout out. But that's my answer. That helps. Does that help? So it's not really what I was thinking about. I was thinking more in terms of whether you think DC power will 
much, so you have a place in Europe. But if America claiming large percentage gains by doing it, and I just don't believe it. Um, and in the U and in the UK and Europe, we operate things very differently, and I think the percentage gains are quite small. Having said that, there will be some 380 volt DC systems going, and therefore you talk about an upgradable one. You can upgrade it, but you can't change it from AC to DC. No. Can't. But then, you know, if that was the case with anything there, that whole thing would have to go anyway, because you're now changing the fundamental power infrastructure for that if you had to make the to DC. It's a good point. But, um, you know, I, I, in terms of opinions, I don't think we, we've ever thought along those lines yet because it certainly worked very far from thinking along the lines of DC in EMEA for now. So it hasn't come up with a radar for us. You're purely an AC power company. Please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Wonder whether or not you could tell us what factors are preventing greater uptake of software defined networking in the data centre? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because obviously, as a company, as a professional, we deal with the physical infrastructure, which is driven by what happens further up the stack. But that's a question where you know you really have to talk to the Cisco. So I'm afraid I can't help you That's all right, with that particular question. So the point about obviously um, virtualization uh, in storage and networking that I was making was therefore what drives things further down the stack, which is what I'm interested in um, and which is what I deal with. So that's where our knowledge as a company will be more, more involved in. But um, there might be some Maori colleagues, maybe Maric has some personal ideas that Maric's been involved in. Maric is busy being married. Has been involved in other areas of, of IT, but certainly myself, I won't be able to answer that. Any further questions? Yeah, of course. How can I feel that? I feel like the president of the United States making the first statement. Then. Yeah. So, um, where does Guy see a motion called IT? Um, because we're all competing, we're trying to drive down costs. Um, so we've got PUEs of, in my data center, it's about 1.67, but um, liquid cooling is about 1,300 times more efficient than air. So there's all these companies trying to drive us towards the liquid cooled situation. But as far as I can see, there's not a lot of data center companies buying into this. So I would really love to have a PUE of 1.03, but where's the tipping point? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, liquid cooling is just one. Cooling is hideously expensive. And it's obviously the premise of a, an idea that seems to make sense, but in practice, when you say something about it, that's another thing entirely. If you're going to get involved in that, you have to design, your whole data center design strategy has to be around that type of cooling. Uh, and yes, it will give you some gains where you get the right PUE, but again, you know, PUE is a measure that was just thought of by a guy, one of the guys that worked for Microsoft on the plane from Tokyo, and he just thought, hey, you know, how easy is touching this? But it's a, it's, it wasn't meant to be a badge where, like, if I hit this PUE, that's fine. And only Green Grid has really split PUE into three different levels, depends on what level we're talking about, the whole data center, we're talking about around the UPS, or we're talking around the actual servers themselves. And so we're really complicating this whole issue of PUE. And so if you have a goal where you say, I need to hit a PUE of, of X, well, there are many ways to achieve this goal, and we can look at them individually, but in isolation, should that be just your goal? Would that create the benefits that you think you need when that happens, as such? Um, you've heard of, I don't know if you've heard of a company called um, Geo Petroleum, uh, based in Walking. They always kind of have a PUE of, um, I think it was zero point or three, or something like that. Um, and the, the IT director there, I've had a couple of chats with him, and said, look, it, it, I've achieved certain things, but it's by no means what we want to, because it's a misleading figure, or benchmark, as it were. Um, we know that if you get involved in some of the things that we've just been talking about, in terms of um, chimney, active chimney systems, then it has massive gains on EPUE. But again, I really, really advise you not to look at PUE as purely, you know, you've got your, 
you've got your whole data center, and you've got your, your, your critical servers, and it's just a ratio of two. That's it. So I agree with you there, that's fantastic. But as we drive compute higher and higher, so whatever it is, Gen A2, which is the biggest super, super computer in the world, is now 17 megawatts, 23.4 megawatts gold. How do you justify that amount of expense and still stay green? So this is where I'm on about. It's, it's, I'm on about how you drive down the possibility that you have this huge great compute power, but traditionally we have to put a quick compute power, 67p to cool it. How do we drive that initiative down? The Finns have done a great job. What you were talking about before, about the, um, I told thing about this Finnish company that have got a data center and they sell the heat back to the council. So they pay for them to call their data center. So where are you thinking about in terms of all that technology? Because let's face it, as Moore's law goes up and up and up, and there's no sign that it's going to drop, we are going to have to talk about how are we going to keep this going and cool it and regulate it and manage it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And the this is where data centers have a complete power. <laughs> I mean, part of that would be you know what are the certain manufacturing companies doing about heat, for example, the removal of heat themselves, where it takes a bit of pressure off the actual plant in terms of cooling. Well, part of it as well is the cost of electricity. Sometimes in a high density environment, you're going to need power. I mean, you know, it's going to have power. Yes, you know, we, even with Moore's law, getting to the tip of Moore's law, it's going to be so many billions of microprocessors on the chip. It's not going to have to be things like molecular, molecular, um, you know, where it's literally so dense at the molecular level. You know what I mean? The amount of heat that will be involved in on that level is just incredible. So there's going to be some challenges ahead. But then, if there's heat, if there's, um, I know the gentleman in the back is focused on the heat and you're focused on the power, which is quite interesting. The power bit is part of this massive power line. You generate your own power, right? You you get you just get completely out of the grid and you focus on ways that you have sustainable renewable energy that is used. But that comes back to cloud computing, doesn't it? In a sense. If we go into a utility-based computing system as, a, as, a, as an industry, then really there'll be less and less enterprise data centers anyway. Right? And the ones that are left would have cloud, hybrid cloud technology involved in them. And so really the focus would be how do these cloud companies right, generate their heat, their, their, their power? How do they use their power? How do they dissipate the heat? And that now becomes about how they design our data centers. Scratch. Site selection is such an important part of the cloud computing data center design. In fact, it's probably the number one priority. If you don't get the site right, it's not going to work. Hydro 66, for example, the site selection was the key thing for them because of power generation and also about heat dissipation. You know, so we can have all these, we can talk about all these challenges, that only just really pushes the whole agenda of the paradigm shift to and a certain data to the design from scratch and deal with the challenges, rather than trying to fix the challenge using the whole paradigm and the old ways of data center design, build, deployment, and maintenance. If that helps the answer, very fluffy and cheating. I'll let you go on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any further questions? Yeah, I think we've been here for a while. Okay, again, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry. Um, bear in mind, as I said, we've got four corners to, um, to us. So, it's all very well listening to, to me ramble on, thinking you know stuff. But you really want to talk to the experts, you know, that are here. So um, I just want to introduce you to the team so you know who's who. Um, at the DCIM side, we have Mary Tosdensky. He's our international DCIM manager. 
what you don't know about, um, what he doesn't know about decent software, trust me, it's not worth knowing. He's the man, the big man over there. Um, on, on, the, on the cooling sector, you have Craig, Craig Brown. He's, he's the guy to talk to you about cooling. He's over there on, on my left, um, right at the back. Uh, the power and monitoring section is over here, and so you talk to Scott, Scott Harrison, he's the sales director for Europe, uh, EMEA, so you can speak to him. And there are loads of guys, and Tio, Tio's over there as well, Tio's the MD of Guys Europe, um, so you can speak to him. And please, you know, have a chat with these guys, ask them questions. Um, they'll be able to give you more specific answers than I ever can. So thank you very much for that. Cheers.